Yeah, well, good evening, everyone, to uh, our uh, joint uh, meeting with the Mining Institute of Scotland. Um, I'm going to hand over very quickly to uh, our EGS president, uh, Tom, Tom Challens, and um, Tom will give a, a word of welcome as well. And then I think Mark Friel is going to introduce our speaker for this evening. So, Tom. Thank you very much, Graham. Yes, uh, welcome to what is a very special evening on the EGS lecture calendar. Um, our joint meeting with the Mining Institute of Scotland. And it's a particularly exciting meeting, as we were, you must have heard us just talking about, you know, having people from far afield here. And, uh, that's what I really like about this, this lecture, is that it attracts a very diverse audience from quite literally all over the world. So that's, um, and a very good attendance as well. So that's fantastic. Um, on the EGS and the Geological Society news, I have one announcement to make, and that is we are this close to being able to get back in person to have our Clough Medal and the remaining lectures of this year in the Grant Institute, the, the Hutton Lecture Theatre. So um, we've just got one more hurdle to to get over, and then once that uh, has been achieved, you should hopefully receive an email inviting you out, inviting you to the lectures in person. It will also be streamed live as well if you can't make it. So that's all the EGS news for this evening. That uh, next Club Medal lecture will be on the 2nd of March. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Mark Friel from the Mining Institute of Scotland, who will introduce our speaker for this evening. Mark. Okay, thank you, Tom. Good evening, everybody. It's good to see such a, such a wide range of people tonight and such a huge uh, audience. Tonight's presentation is the Clogout Gold Mine Exploration in North Wales, presented by Mark Austin from Arbor Resources. The Clogouts in David's Gold Mine in Wales is the, is the source of most of the UK's gold, mined historically from very rich coal seams. Arby's technical team are applying a multidisciplinary approach, employing modern exploration tools such as 3D scanning and mine modelling, drawing from both the surface and underground, geochemistry and geophysics. Mark has a career spanning four decades with a particular focus on gold. Now I'll tell you a bit about Mark Austin. He's a Chief Operating Officer and Senior Geologist of Alba Mineral Resources PLC. He has significant management and operational experience in a career spanning four decades across a range of commodities, but with a particular focus on gold. He spent 40 years based in South Africa before returning to the UK in 2020. Now, Mark, I can hand over to you uh, to present this evening's technical presentation. Okay, I'm going to then... Okay, is that okay? Can everybody see that? Yep. Okay, good stuff. All right. Um, I'm just going to, to get rid of you guys. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, it's all um, working well at my end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me know if it doesn't. Okay. Um, well, thank you to everybody. Um, I'm particularly excited to have been invited to give this talk. Um, when I started putting this stuff together, I suddenly realized how much work we've actually done in, in two years in, in, in clock eye. Um, and it's, been, it's quite daunting what we've done. So uh, there's quite a lot of to, to, to go through and to see. And um, so I'll plow on now. So that's the old obligatory disclaimer, which I'll see you all read in detail. Thank you. Um, just in terms of the talk overview, I'm going to talk a little about the history, talk about the, the regional geology, the local geology, the modeling, which is absolutely um, integral to, uh, to what we're doing on this mine for this uh, exploration project. Um, just go through some of the exploration techniques that we've used and want to use. And then I think at the last bit is the contributors to this. It's, it's really important uh, to mention the guys who have done a lot of work over the, a lot of the years uh, and we use their work diligently and um, with, a, with a lot of um, enthusiasm and it's very relevant to what we do. So I'll, I'll mention those names at the end, but uh, uh, maybe at the end, but not 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 least. 
So Clock Eye St David's um, is located in northwest Wales, and the closest town is called Dolkefly. Um, it's in the old district of Merioneth, and there's a very, very good book called The Gold Mines of Merioneth by Hall. Um, if you want to know, read more about it, and especially the history, that's a really good book to go for. It's out of print, obviously, but you can get it on eBay and those, those places. In terms of the gold discovery, um, gold was discovered in, in, in sort of the 1840s, 1850s in the area. Um, oh, sorry, 1854, sorry, at St. David's. Now, it's quite a funny story because St. David's itself started off as a copper mine. And three or four or five years after it started uh, mining copper, um, a couple of the managers walked across the waste tip, somebody bent down, picked up a rock and said, wow, there's gold here. And within a few months, it became a gold mine. Um, so in terms of production, um, official numbers are 80,000 ounces, um, which up to 1998. So the mines um, really mined between 1854 and 1911. Um, I think it's worth bearing in mind that um, those are the days of the gold standard. I think that gold standard um, was in place um, up until um, 1971, if I remember rightly. So um, the Phoenicians started, uh, we know the Phoenicians have been here in the past. We know the Romans were here. They probably mined the gold from, from the alluvial workings and they might have bought other gold from the local um, Britons at the same time. Alba has been doing work, has come in since 2018. Um, they messed around a little bit, not messed around, but they sort of, sort of uh, orientated themselves for, for, for two years and then 2020 um, things took off with, with a big bang basically. Um, the targets of Clock Ice and Davids um, which we have identified as a, as a company for near-term development and you'll hear these names as we go through them often through this, this um, presentation and it's the Clock Ice and it's Clock Eye, um, St David's Mine, it's the old main load and it's the Lake Faith area. Um, I'll be constantly referring to them, so don't have to worry, them, worry about them now. The original license holdings in that diagram on the right uh, is marked in green. Um, we then took over Gwynfinneth, Gwynfinneth which is um, the second largest gold mine um, in the UK, running at a, a historic production of 40,000 ounces. And then recently, last year, we took out the, the blue licenses to the, to the north, and you'll see why that pattern is like it is. Um, between uh, Clock Eye and Grinfinith, there was 130,000 ounces of gold um, produced, as I said, officially. And uh, I probably think that I think there's probably double the amount of gold has been um, produced. There was a lot of stories of, of theft of mining, of miners going in, um, finding visible gold in the face, and then sort of taking lumps of it out, out at, a, at a different um, uh, exit to the mine. There's also um, uh, stories of they, they would put it out on this waste tip and then at night their wives and kids would come and pick up the gold bits pieces. Um, and there's actually a story from an old uh, mine manager at Gwenfinneth. Um, he managed to save £7,000 in one year, but he did that on a salary of £1,500. So we just need to know, understand wonder where that additional money came from. Um, Clock Eye has been very much, in fact, the whole area has been very much um, stories of boom and bust. Um, Jem, I think, is probably well aware of that. Jem's on this call at the moment. Um, so a guy called William Pritchard Morgan, um, he um, made a fortune in Australia, came out, saw the Grinfinith wine up for sale or for investment, went in there, made a fortune, lost a fortune, made another fortune, lost another fortune. So it's, it's that, that's the history of, of, of the mining area. And it's basically because the gold is so nuggety that literally there's stories of, foot, of, of, a, of a face consisting of 40% gold when they've hit it. But they may go for it for a couple of meters and then bang, it's gone again. And they could mine for months before they hit gold again. So one of the things you have to understand in the evaluation, and we, we need to address in the evaluation of this project in the future, is how do we address that this is extreme nuggety um, uh, characteristics of, of this ore body. In terms of regional geology, um, you'll see then 
the blue trace is the clock eye shale, which wraps itself around the central Harlech dome. Um, away from the, from the uh, clock eye uh, from the Harlech dome. In clock eye St. David's, the, the uh, strata is dipping 30 to 40 degrees to the south. Um, in the green, you'll see the trace of the mineralized quartz veins that we know about. Um, and these were mapped by the BGS, so we've used those, but we've also been finding other ones as well. Let's move on there. Um, you get really to, to local mine geology itself, and you'll see again, there's the blue trace of the clock eye shales. There's, um, and the yellow is the, is the plan view of the mined out workings that's taken place since the 1800s. Um, and you'll see, if I've got this little thing here, sorry, just bear with me, I'll do this. Um, laser pointer. There's a fault here, which bisects the two um, mining areas. It's called the Brentingen Fault. It downflows quite a long way to the east. And obviously, because of the dip of the strata, it offsets the, the strata, it's clog us in Davis towards the north. Um, there's two features here which we'll talk about. This is called the Timney Cornell Adit. This is called the Lech Fraith Adit in this area here. And this, this is the main workings um, that, were, that were done over, over, the, over the history of the mine. There is copper mineralization. Um, as you go further west, the copper um, credits get bigger. And the, there's a mine to the west here called Vigra. And that was a full on. Um, uh, copper mine. There, there were uh, instances of um, where the, the refinery phoned them up and said, look, there's quite a lot of gold in the copper here. Um, so one of the big distinctive features is a plunging anticline close to the south. And then the veins, as I said, mapped with the, the, um, the green veins as by the BGS. And there's veins coming through here, or a set of a suite of veins coming through here. The, the pink is, uh, is some sills um, in the stratigraphy, also dipping towards the south, the southeast. And these have, and you'll see later on the talk, um, all these elements have a bearing on the gold mineralization. Okay, that's the 3D model. And this is really being a, a boon to us. And um, so here in this light blue color here is we've digitized all the old mine workings. The Brentinian fault comes through here. This would be the offset here. Um, this is St. David's mine on the east side. And then the old clock iron mine with the old stopes. Um, and then um, some minor stopes here. And in the old days, they drove the leg faith addict from just above a stream uh, in here to act as a drainage addict to go underneath everything, and drain the mine. Because in those days, um, water underground was, was a real problem to them. They didn't have strong enough pumps to dewater. So they, they believe that putting a drainage level in would, would, would sort that problem out. There are a couple of um, minor showings of grandfather's stoping and the 710. I'll get to those as well. Um, so the, all the ventilation comes down through these old working and, and egresses out here, as does the water as well. We do have bats in the mine, um, lesser, lesser um, horseshoe and they are protected by an EPS license. So in the winter when they're coming to hibernate, we can't access the underground workings to do any work. So we tend to do any work we want to do on surface. Um, yeah, there's the NRW, it's natural resource, um, not natural resources, Wales, a very keen um, naturalists as, as you probably all well know. And um, we, we're working very well together. But uh, they are, um, they, they don't take shortcuts in terms of ecology and the preservation of the ecology. Um, so just to make sure I've done all that. One comment there is that we were trying to make do, we make use of this underground workings. They're very accessible, uh, probably a two and a half by three meter diameter um, um, size. And those, those workings to replicate them today would cost us millions. So, we, um, we were trying to sort of leapfrog ahead and save some money by, by ac accessing and using the, the, those workings. Right, I'm just going to do a whole bunch of sections here and just to sort of explain to you um, the various components that go together to um, influence the, the, the gold mineralization. So, 
this is really a sketch map through the Tinia Cornell Adit. So this is um, this is north to the south, and you have the the, the clock eye shales, Cambrian age, um, but below that you have the Gamlan formation, which is um, uh, um, shales towards the top, but then as it downward coarsening, upward fining, and then the main truck formation again um, upward coarsening as you go out towards the south. Um, we have um, the clock eye shells themselves are very carbonaceous, and this has a part to play in in the uh, in the gold mineralization from from the from the veins. I just like to thank a guy called David Pelham, who did good old fashioned geological mapping of the Tony, Tony Cornell added, and it sort of bring, brought back memories of when I was in South Africa as a student in 1981, um, mapping every single little contact. Um, and we do use his mapping a lot. We've also um, used, uh, we've generated an MSc project looking at the magnetic susceptibility and the geochemistry through the upper gamma formation and the clock eye shale formations. This is a plot on the right hand side. And the reason we did that is to see if there's any zonation, any zones that we can um, correlate regionally within the shales and the gamelan formation. Um, again, it's quite important that we can we will be able to do that. Um, the the clockwise shales tend to um, uh, go to distal, from proximal to distal, and then back up to proximal again through the sequence. Same section, and then Pelham again. He identified several. Um, groups of sills. I mean, through the sills are hydrothermally altered. Nobody's really put a classification on them, but they're very, they're very silicious, uh, very fine grained, but very distinct. And in this area, they're called the green stones. And the reason is because it is, it is very green in, in nature. These sills um, are very important um, in terms of where, or their relationship with the veins. We found four major sill groups. And we, in our, in our drilling of the area, we come across them on a regular basis. So we're able to uh, model them very, very nicely as well. So what we've done, because of the carbonaceous shale and the nature of the, of the carbonaceous um, of the top of the gamlan and, and the base of the mine trog, we've now identified what we call an economic base and an economic top. So there's a zone there in which we believe that the veins that come through um, would be mineralized or could be mineralized. So what we're looking through here is the stratigraphy and the sills themselves. If we put on just some of the, the don't worry about the nomenclature, but these are some of the, the, the loads or the quartz veins that come through. Um, you'll see that um, most of them are, are related to the, the, the clock eye shells. Um, and also there's a deflection of these um, de uh, loads through through the, the um, through the sills. Um, what else have we got here? So so that's that's that. So if we then look at the package, so the economic base, look by shales and the economic top and the mine tri tri formation. Even though we find um, sills or sorry, load veins outside of that zone on surface, those will extend into the zone at some point. So we don't, we don't um, ignore them. We have to model them and calculate where they would come through into, so we actually um, create a target window at depth um, for where we think there could be uh, mineralization. At the moment, we've got the physical and the chemical influences on the gold mineralization, and we seem to have nailed that down pretty well in, in, our, in, our, in our model. If we look at the, the, the veins themselves, this is, a, um, this is a, a, a planned view. It's not one single vein, it's they're probably following um, shear zones, and they split and join and they do all sorts of things. They, they thin, they get thicker um, and very, very difficult to predict. Um, so I'm just going through something here as well. 
basically the veins are, are sheets of veins with wall rock um, in between. Um, and then there's the interplay then of the of the, the sills. And then also within the vein is what's called a stone dike, also hydrothermally, hydrothermally altered um, material, igneous material, um, which is obviously um, intruded along, uh, alongside the, the, the quartz vein emplacement. What you're seeing here is um, what we call the ribbon type vein. You also have these blowouts of what we call um, elephant, elephant quartz, which is a later um, intrusion of quartz and totally barren. And then we find, we find areas of gold mineralization are where we find jogs, we find uh, like that, splits or joins of veins. So we've tended to find there's, and there's a lot of anecdotal stories um, from the old mining guys. They're very, very good at, at observation. They're not so good at, obviously, because they weren't geologists, they weren't good at interpretation. But they sort of said, well, if a branch goes to the, to the northeast, then it carries gold or could carry gold. If it goes branches to the north, to the southwest, they're generally barren. And these were just sort of general rules of thumb that the old timers had. We found that um, these, these ones over here are actually associated with galena. And again, I'll come up with that. And then later on, these ones down here are all found with tellurides. These, these observations have really come um, from Simon Domini and Ian Platten. They did some fantastic, good, solid um, uh, academic work here on, on these areas. And we still use their, their work a lot. If we look at the, the core, here's what the load quartz looks like in here. You see the sheets, it's very, it's all over the place, it's dirty. Then we have a cross-cutting elephant quartz coming through here, which will be barren, and then back into the load quartz again. And then lying above it is the greenstone sill. This uh, greenstone sill is very silicious in nature and very uh, fine-grained. So basically to cap, there's a complex interplay between the veins, the morphology of the veins, the stratigraphy and the sills. The old timers said, if the vein was exiting just below a sill, that's a great place to go and find the gold. So there's a relationship there, which I don't think we quite understand right now, but it seems to be working for us. Um, we add to this the extreme nuggety nature of the gold. So there's, there's a lot of things at play here uh, for us to start targeting where we find gold mineralization. The next slide is really to start looking at our drilling campaign. Um, and I'll just say up front that our drilling, we say every single RNS, but we still get slated by the, uh, by the, um, the, the shareholders. Our drilling has always been for structure and not for evaluation, not for gold grades because of the, the nuggety nature. So if you look back, talk back to what I, uh, the diagram I initially showed you, here's the old, this is just the Western extent of the old, the old time is mined out area. There's the leg freight level. And then the exit over here, um, this is where my, our mine offices are and things like that, there's shit coming through here. This blue area here is an is a area um, uh, called the Lech Flair Shaft, and it's currently flooded at the moment. I'll talk about that just now. So our first pilot program for drilling was in November 2019, and they were very constrained in terms of access. So they ended up drilling down in the ore body, in the vein itself, which I guess it shows us something, but it wasn't any good for any possible evaluation. In September, October 2020, we did some, some underground drilling. Um, I'll show you the rig now. Um, this was basically to then see if there are any parallel veins to, to the main, the, the, what we call the 710 load area here. And we did find, in fact, our best value to date um, from underground drilling was sitting in here. And we believe that to be an extension of the main load system about 550 meters to, to the west of that. Now, the dates, these are the dates that we are allowed to get underground and to, uh, and to uh, the, the bats allow us to go underground. That's the sort of machine we're, we're using. Um, it, uh, it's a, obviously a pneumatic machine. Um, you can get an electric hy hydraulic one as well. This is from South Africa, it's called the Kempe UK9B. And it quite comfortably does holes. Um, we were using BQ in particular here. 
um, this holds up to 180 meters. Then we are phase one surface drilling, we step right back and then we drill below this, the lake face shaft area. That was very, very successful. And I'll show you some, some, uh, some stuff there as well. Um, and then in phase two underground drilling, we drill some more holes to the, to the north and south, looking again for, for other loads. And then phase two was the latest surface drilling, looking for any extensions um, uh, from the main load here and underneath this mining that we've done here and here. This is the seven pin load here. So just as a full database, that's all the drilling we've done. Um, I think it's about um, 11.58 holes in phase one and about um, 1,500 meters um, in phase two from surface, all, all NQ drilling. From that, um, we identified some loads. Straight away, we've got the leg phase page shoot, the extension of that. And that was proven up by this drilling very nicely. Um, we got the extension down to around 20 meters below the level. Um, we found the extension of the, of the main load. We found another load in between, which nobody knew about, even, even the old timers. And we found extensions of the 710 load and the grandfather's south load. So really, we've got one, two, three, four, five loads from something we only expected to get one, maybe two. So that was that's for the drilling, the structural drilling. So we did get gold grades, but we don't worry about them. Then they're not high. I think the highest was four and a half pounds per ton. But that is we discount that because of the highly highly negative nature, negative nature of of, um, of the ore body itself. If you look at leg fresh, so let me just go back. So I'm just going to zoom in on this area in here. This is an old plan of the old timers, and the yellow highlights all these crosses, they were very diligent. They always put on the plans where they found visible gold. And those areas are there where they found visible gold. So we are obviously highly excited about this whole thing. We want to dewater the shaft out here. We've currently got an application pending with NRW. And then we want to get down, clean all this out, um, and then do some, probably some bulk sampling. Um, we've also um, been ac acquired some an old mine plan showing the whole mine along these lines. And that was last, uh, it was hand driven, hand, hand made, and it was last done in 1907. Um, and that shows all the gold um, occurrence, visible gold occurrences as well. So that's really, really, very, 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 very useful for us. So we go back to the Lipfraith um, base shed. Here's the drilling. We're looking at it slightly from, from uh, further to, from the west towards the east. Um, we've now, our, big, our furthest intersection was 120 meters below surface. Um, we are expected to get one uh, load in here. We actually, if you look here, this, this, geology, this, this shading here shows the geology that we found from this drilling. And we found a lower load, an upper load, a thing called the canal, the canal um, vein system, and then the, the soil system. So we actually found four loads in this area. Again, totally unexpected. But thinking about how the, the morphology and, and the veins are, the structure of the veins, not unexpected, I guess, at the end of the day. So we're now looking at doing some sort of development on the ground. Once we've dewatered this, these old areas here, putting down some sort of incline shaft um, and, and, and following this down dip, um, quite a bit of de development to be done here. Um, and then obviously then refurbishing the shaft as well. So these are our, our, our plans, our immediate plans for Clockeye to get into production. The um, model showing the extension of what called the Jack Williams load, which is the, the western extent of the main, main load, the new branch load, which is about 30 meters to the, to the south of that, and then another 20, 30, 20, 30 meters, the 710 load. Again, we've got plans to do development on here, but we'll do, we'll focus on the Lake Freight um, area first. So our drilling philosophy is really, at the beginning, it was like, well, let's go and find the gold. And uh, we soon realized that um, it was not, <laughs> it's not gonna be that simple. Um, as I said, the drilling program was designed to define structure. 
of the stratigraphy, the vein continuity, the sill positions. Each of those contributing to where the, the, the miracle mineralization is in the veins. So in that respect, I think it's been really highly successful. All of that has gone into our 3D model, and that 3D model now directs any near mining exploration we need to do. Um, we did find some gold assay kicks in, in the drilling, particularly phase one, and also underground drilling, but nothing that we could do, um, we could float a mine or a gold mining company on at the moment. Um, but the drilling Lechfraith and Lechfraith itself has now become the primary target for Alba in the future. One of the other things that we've done, because you can't rely on gold intersections, and we need to know, we need to understand that the veins that we intersect have um, are, are worth chasing, are worth following up. So what we did, we did a whole bunch of um, multi-element analysis um, for, all, for all, all these holes, all these samples, to try and get a characteristics of the veins. We use what's called principal component analysis, and we managed to, to classify into four geostatistical zones. Um, this zone here is what we believe well, is, is, the, is, the, is the gold bearing mineralization veins. So you may not find the gold, but we do this lots of um, silver, um, lead in terms of gleaner, tellurium as well, and bismuth. So in our, in our assaying, we, do, we don't just assay for gold now. We do selective multi-element analysis to see where we are, to see if the veins are worth um, or, or potential to be gold bearing in the future. Uh, sampling, right at the thing, um, Alba did some soil sampling. Um, I was, when I came in, I was concerned about doing that because there's a lot of glacial till hanging around. And um, initially, Alba identified 10 um, targets um, based on, on, a, uh, on anomalies from the soil sampling. Um, what I did is said, well, let's take one of the better ones and we did some trenching and we basically found not a lot. Uh, and this is to me a reflection on that the, uh, the, the gold grade has come out of, or the gold values of the soils have come out of the till rather than um, a soil that's been um, reflecting or uh, representative of the bedrock geology underneath. Because of that, we would probably try MMI or ionic leach to see how that works. I know it does work very well. I have used it um, in, in Africa and it does work very well. So um, that's something we, we are looking at again to do better targeted soil sampling. We've also been looking at stream sediment sampling. We've recently done an orientation study. It's very important we do that. It's very important anybody does that. Um, don't just blindly go into a stream and take samples and then get them assayed. Um, we actually uh, got an MSC st study to do that. Um, we sieved it into three different size fractions um, to see which size fraction offered the best anomaly contrasts. And we found obviously the 200 uh, mesh was the best response to the gold mineralization. And now and a lot of this. So we couple that um, with the surface geology, and then we do our stream setup. We'll do our stream sediment sample from there. So hopefully that starts giving us some some regional targets as well. We are, we're looking at. Um, we just contracted a company now, a company called UAVE, to, to fly some aeromags using a drone. Um, the current data is from the B BGS Aramag, which was done in the 70s. Um, we did reinterpret the data, but it's still not giving us sufficient granularity um, for what we, what we require. Um, our spacing will be, as I said, using a drone, fixed wing, fixed wing drone, flying at a height of 100 meters, 50, 50 meter line spacing, and then cross tie, uh, cross -tie um, flight lines as well, um, just, to, just to tie things in. Um, we'll use that data to delineate the stratigraphy and, and the structure. And hopefully that will help us see through the uh, and um, get a bigger picture. Um, other projects we've been doing, um, we've looked at waste tip sampling. We've identified a couple of waste tips. And this one is sitting outside the Tinian Cornell Adit. And just talking to the old timers, they were saying, well, they sort of described how they were how they were doing their, their mining and basically what they were doing underground. They were blasting, 
They were hand cobbing any large pieces with gold in it from the veins. And they were then just um, taking the rest out of his waste and dumping it on the waste on the waste pile. We've been in, we've done a lot of sampling over the waste dump, and we've found one particular area where we're getting an average of about four, nearly four and a half grams per ton from the minus two millimeter size fraction. So we repeated that exercise again to be make sure that we, we, we are confident of those values. And there's no reason why we can't start mining that in the very near future. And we'd use a cut and fill technique there where we would, we'd screen out the, 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 um, the large, large size fractions and put that back as fill. So that dump would sort of be rehabilitated back to what it was before. Um, we, in 2020, in 2020, we purchased a pilot plant. It's, it's, a, um, it's a gravity circuit. And on the right-hand side here, um, the order is the top here, the mill, uh, through a screen into a, into a ribbed centrifuge. centrifuge. Um, the gold um, is concentrated in, in the ribs of the centrifuge. Anything that goes out, hopefully, is, is uh, kept on the sluice mat, sluice mat. And in fact, it's very, very efficient what we've done. Um, we use those, we, we pass those concentrates over a, um, a lab size Holman roofing shaker table to produce a, 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 um, a concentrate. Up to now, we've only got a, the best uh, concentrate value we've got is 479 grams per ton, um, which is not great for a concentrate, I'll be honest with you. And what we've been doing, we've been taking bulk sampling from underground, two or three tons from each area, um, uh, and putting it through this plant. But I think we need larger, larger samples to make it this uh, meaningful. There's some key references, um, and as I said before, there's some people here who have been worked in the past who have been really useful. Their work has been very, very useful for us. And I'm going to make, make some names here. There's Simon Dominey, probably most people know, from Ian Platten. David Pelham, who's a mine geologist here, did some great work. There's John Mason, who's done a lot of work on the geochemistry and the mineralogy. Um, John, John Rottenberg, who's now passed away. George Hall, who wrote the book, um, Gold Mines of Marianneth. Um, I'd like to thank w Wardle Armstrong, um, particularly Martin Downing, who've been very useful for us already, um, helpful in us on the um, health and safety side of things. Um, there's an old guy called Jack Williams. His family still live in the area. I'm very friendly with his, his, his grandson. I've got some videos of the guy. And he was what I would call a proto-geologist. He, uh, he was a great observer. observer. He, he understood where the gold would be in name, and he was sort of their go-to person to say, where do we go to next, Jack, because we lost the gold. Um, he's passed on now, but I really, really wish I had time, a few hours to spend with him. I mean, fascinating. And then there's Harry Guest, who's one of my geologists, fresh out of Campbell School of Mines, and they do produce a very good class geologist in their MSc program, and Harry has been instrumental in putting that 3D program together. So I do thank him as leaving us now. Uh, he's, he's got new challenges ahead of him, but um, he's leaving behind a great legacy. So I think that is my talk. I probably went through very quickly. Um, so that's me over, guys. Okay. Thank